Good afternoon and welcome to the Beef Cattle Research Council's webinar on bovine TB, understanding the disease and how it's managed in Canada. My name is Stacey Domalewski. I'm the Science and Extension Coordinator for the BCRC and I'll be your moderator tonight. Today's session will last for approximately one hour, but it may go a little longer depending on the number of questions you have during the question and answer period. If you're on Twitter, tweet along with us tonight using hashtag BeefWebinar. We are recording the session and I'll email the link to the recording to everybody that's registered in the next couple of days. So if you miss hearing anything tonight and want to watch it again, you can. So of course you'll be able to hear and see tonight's presenters, but we can't hear or see you. So if you do want to communicate with us, type into the small chat window on the control panel on the side of your screen. If you have questions or comments for any of our presenters tonight, that's where you can add them there as well. And we'll answer them all at the end of the hour. If your internet connection is a bit slow, it might help to close other programs that are using internet as well, um, as well as close the webcam window. This means you won't be able to see us, but it hopefully will make the audio come through a bit longer, a bit louder, sorry, and we'll be able to make the slides look a little bit better for you. So here's what we'll be covering for tonight's webinar. With that, let's get started. I'm pleased to introduce our first speaker of the night, Dr. Reynolds Bergen. Reynolds is the Science Director for the Beef Cattle Research Council. So in a nutshell, his job is to communicate research to beef producers and explain beef producers to researchers. So um, if you look at the Canadian Cattlemen Magazine, you will also recognize him from his column that he writes there every month. Okay, tell me when I should go, Stacy. You're good to go. Okay, thanks, Stacy. So uh, I promise to be brief, and I'll endeavor to do that. So tonight I'm going to tell you how BCRC makes the sausage. Why is my machine not working? There we go. So the BCRC, we are Canada's largest not-for-profit industry funder of cattle, forage, and beef research, and we fund things that will hopefully help improve the competitiveness and sustainability of Canada's beef industry. Now, all of the BCRC funds are producer national checkoff dollars, and so it's producers who decide how these funds get invested. Um, now these these 12 producers from across Canada they are the BCRC these are the individuals who are deciding what research the BCRC is going to fund so so these people are making research funding investment decisions on behalf of all of the the producers who are paying check off in Canada and and we take this responsibility really really seriously and and so funding deciding which project to fund isn't a matter of flipping coins and it's not a matter of throwing darts it's about making the most informed decisions that we can and so our current funding cycle actually started about a year ago you might remember this survey that that we that we were promoting um, where we asked participants to, to rate a whole variety of different research projects according to whether they're very highly important or highly important or moderately important or not very important or not important at all. And uh, when this thing was all said and done, we got about 500 responses and more than half of them were from producers. So so we, we were pretty pleased with that. And if you're actually interested in, in what the producer survey results were, we blogged about this a couple of months ago back in November. And so all that stuff is, is available on our website. Um, but producers aren't the only ones that we survey. We also survey other funders um, from across the country on an ongoing basis to, to find out what they're funding. And last spring, we actually went a step further and we asked them, okay, of the projects that you've had completed recently, how well did they turn out? Um, and, and some of those projects work really well and they came up with a really effective answer or solution to the to the problem they were tackling. Others didn't work and that doesn't mean that it was bad science, it, it just means that sometimes not all the shots go in the net. And other projects had been making really good progress but they, they weren't quite done yet and they still needed some more work before before they could you know check it off the list. And so 
armed with all of that survey information from, from producers and, and from funders, we, we convened a workshop to map out where to go next. And so we had a lot of people there with BCRC reps were there, of course, but we also invited some researchers and some cow vets and some nutritionists and some pharmaceutical reps and some packers and some producers from outside the BCRC and some other funders as well. And, and we presented them with all those survey results and things and then we talked about where to go next. So we split all the people that, that attended this workshop into, into one of these groups according to, to what they're most interested in or what their expertise was. And then over the course of the day, we got them to uh, you know, talk about and focus in on how research could help the Canadian beef industry address some of the biggest issues and problems and, and opportunities that are facing us. And um, in, in the course of this, we weren't asking them to uh, set priorities. We were asking them to identify outcomes, and those are two different things. A priority might be something like animal health, which isn't, isn't very specific. It's not a target at all. It's just really kind of like the broad side of the barn. An outcome would be something like this. That's way more specific, and that's like painting the bullseye on the target. It really gives industry something to focus on and it gives the researchers a really clear target to aim their research at too. So we took all these surveys and discussions and outcomes from this uh, process and, and used them to, to update our national beef research strategy and we released that last fall. So then in November we asked researchers to send us research ideas that, that were aligned with, with our strategy. And uh, that starts with a letter of intent. That's just kind of a four-page summary saying, well, here's what I'd like to research. Are you interested in this BCRC? And it takes a few minutes to read each one of these, except that we got 120 of them. So at four pages each, that's 480 pages, which is roughly equivalent to reading the first half of the Old Testament. And uh, of course, our BCRC reps got to read them all. And, and so did a staff, and so did some other staff from CCA and Alberta Beef and uh, Canfax Research Services, and, and we also brought in some outside experts um, who were experts in food safety and beef quality, animal health and welfare, feed grains, feed efficiency, forage production, that sort of thing, and the environment to, to help the, the, the council um, sort through these and decide which ones to fund. So these letters of intent were all evaluated individually based on how they were lined up with the strategy, um, with the strength of the research team, and with the, how relevant the research seemed to be um, to, to the industry. So there's going to be things that the researchers are interested in, and there's going to be things that, that the council's interested in, and what we're really looking for is this area of mutual interest. And, and letters of intent where that area of overlap is really, really big, that's the kind of stuff we're looking for, where the researchers are really interested in, in addressing what, what uh, industry's after. So in early February, the council met, we discussed, they discussed all 120 of these letters of intent and weeded out about half of them. And the survivors were invited to develop full proposals. And so that's what these researchers are doing now. They're, they're composing these full proposals. So compared to a letter of intent, this full proposal is way more detailed and way lengthier. And there's gonna be 60 of them and so if each of them is 20 pages, that's going to be 1,200 pages. And that's rough, roughly equivalent to War and Peace. And so our BCRC members get to read all 1,200 pages of this stuff. And so do the staff, and so do our experts get to read all this stuff again. That's a lot of reading, and it's really highly, highly technical. And none of us are experts enough to in all of these really specialized areas to, to really be good judges of them. And so each one of these 60 proposals is going to get sent to a number of experts from around the world who are actively researching this area of research. 
And those guys, those researchers are going to dis dissect these in really fine detail. They're going to, you know, evaluate whether it's really new research, if it's uh, well designed, whether it's, you know, using the, you know, best accepted techniques, whether the budget's appropriate, whether the research team is capable, and whether it'll develop a, a or generate a, a scientifically sound answer. So they're going to tell us whether it's good science, give it a thumbs up, or thumbs down if it's not so good science. So then the council's going to evaluate all these two. They're going to evaluate each of those proposals. They're going to evaluate each of the the peer reviews as well. And, and they're going to put it through a practicality filter. And so we might get a research proposal that comes up with a, a really scientifically sound design for a better mousetrap. And, you know, but even if that design worked, it might not be any better or cost effective or practical than what we already have. And so, so those kinds of proposals are going to get weeded out. There's just no, no interest in funding them. They might be scientifically interesting, but not of tremendous value to the industry. On the other hand, there's going to be some research that, that does stand to, to provide some really big improvements to current production practices to a large number of producers and so that's the kind of stuff that the council is going to end up funding. So you know, over the course of this about half of these 60 projects are probably going to get weeded out again and the ones that survive are the ones that are going to get knitted together into our proposal to the federal ag minister for the next beef science cluster. And so that'll be our third cluster if things unfold as we hope they will. And so, you know, now you know how we make the sausage, and I'll, I'll leave you with this. The BCRC has as thorough a process as anyone uh, to make sure that we're funding good research that's going to benefit our industry. And I also want to emphasize that this whole thing um, revolves around the dedication of the, the BCRC producer reps because they are volunteering their time and effort to make sure that your checkoff dollars are, are getting invested in the best way possible. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Stacy and uh, let the rest of you listen to what you actually signed up for. So thanks for listening. Oh, thanks, Reynolds. That was fantastic. You got I'm sure everybody on the council very excited now that you've counted the number of pages they have for you here coming up. <laughs> All right, so our next producer is Karen Schmidt. She's the beef production specialist with the Alberta Beef Producers. Karen grew up on a mixed cattle and grain operation and got her master's degree at the University of Alberta. As the beef production specialist, Karen provides technical support in the areas of production, health, welfare, and research. Thanks, Stacy. Um, my contact information is is there as well, and and in the context of this presentation, I I think it's important to mention that about since November ish, I've been the industry liaison to the Western Area Emergency Operations Center for the current tuberculosis investigation. While this presentation focuses on on bovine TB more in the high-level context, um, I've learned way more about TB than I ever wanted to. So let's take it away with uh, what is bovine tuberculosis and it's caused by a bacteria and, and many types of mycobacteria exist and just like many types of mycobacteria exist, many different types of, of Mycobacterium bovis exist. So mycobacteria also causes things like Yoni's disease in cattle, it causes human tuberculosis as well as leprosy, there's an avian type of mycobacteria. So there, there's many many different types of these bacteria in the environment and in animal hosts. And my slide doesn't want to advance. There we go. So it is infectious and while contagious, it's not overly so. It, it really requires frequent and extended nose-to-nose -nose contact or contact with bodily secretions over an extended period of time. The bacteria is sensitive to heat and sunlight uh, as well as dry conditions. It's not so sensitive to cold, which is a little bit strange for a bacteria, but it's, it's a hardy bacteria when it comes to cold and moist conditions. It really causes a slow and progressive disease and it is zoonotic. So actually Mycobacterium bovis out of all of the Mycobacteria 
can infect a, a large number of hosts. Pretty, min, pretty much all warm-blooded mammals uh, can be infected by bovis, but its preferred host is cattle. So it forms granulomas or these lesions, which is caused by the body trying to wall off an infection. And the bacteria spreads through the body, through the blood and lymphatic system, and it really can lie dormant until the immune system breaks down. So it's a very sneaky bug. It, it's basically a, a bacterial ninja. It can it can hide in the hide in the body, hide until something happens that causes it to become active and form these lesions. There's really no outward clinical signs until the disease is very, very far advanced. So you won't be able to just look at an animal and see that it has TB. Uh, if the disease is really far advanced, you may see a loss of appetite, a weight loss, maybe a fluctuating fever. They, if there's lung involvement, they may chronically cough. But again, you won't see these symptoms until the disease is really far advanced. Uh, it is a reportable disease in Canada and we have an eradication program because we are considered a TB free country and I think uh, Alan will talk about this more later. Uh, but this is a, an important status for Canada. Our surveillance relies on surveillance at slaughter. 95% uh, of our cattle are slaughtered at federal plants. And what they do there is they look for lesions consistent with TB because lots of different diseases can cause lesions. Just because an animal has a lesion doesn't mean it's a tuberculosis lesion. So they look for lesions that are consistent with, T with bovine TB. And our last case in Canada prior to this current investigation was in 2011 in British Columbia. Apologies for the picture, if anyone was eating, but this is what you may find. This is actually a picture out of Michigan of a, of a quite advanced case of tuberculosis in lungs in a, in a heifer in Michigan, I believe. So in 1923, our eradication program began in Canada. And in 1961, a test and remove program was instituted. And, and these dates are going to become important in a minute when I show another slide. Um, they didn't start full herd depopulations until 1978. And in 1985, we were declared uh, tuberculosis free by the World Health Organization for, for Animal Health, basically the OIE. And this again is it's statistical freedom. So it, it indicates 99% 0.9% of cattle and 99.8% of percent of herds are TB free. So this is very similar to North America just got declared free of measles. However, there are active outbreaks ongoing in areas in the United States. So with statistical freedom, we do expect to get these isolated cases that pop up from time to time. And we can there are provisions in the regulations for our free status for those isolated cases. So basically, uh, if we have a positive case and we don't have another case in the same area that's unrelated to that case, we, 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 within four years we retain our, our free status. So basically we need to have an unrelated case within a four-year time period in the same general area before any impacts on our status come up. So this basically shows a timeline from about 1971 to 2015 of the prevalence of TB infected herds in Canada. And right here, 1979 was when they instituted the eradication, or the whole herd depopulation, sorry. So the whole herd depopulation started in 1979, and you can see that's where we started to really make a dent in the number of, of herds that we had in Canada and really started to work our way towards that freedom in 1985. So now it's time for a pop quiz. Stacy. Absolutely, all right. So we're going to be launching a couple full questions during the webinar. So for your, those of you who aren't familiar with them, sorry, I'm not able to click on it right now. Um, what the poll questions will allow you to do is it's your opportunity to participate in the webinar. So this first one here, as Karen mentioned, is a bit of a pop quiz to see if you are paying attention so far. So your answers here are anonymous to everybody else watching the webinar. 
So our first question today, uh, what causes bovine TB? Is it a virus, a bacterium, a fungus, or none of the above? So you can select the one that you think applies. I'll give you a little more time here to get your answers in. All right, it looks like almost everybody has voted here. So we'll share the answers. It looks like they're a very smart group. Uh, everyone passed. 100%. <laughs> Good work. People were paying attention. There we go. All right, back to you. That's it for me, Stacy. So for this section. Hey. No problem. So Karen will be speaking to us again here and at the end of the webinar. So next, I would like to introduce our next presenter, Dr. Alan Preston. So Alan is uh, the bovine TB coordinator for Manitoba. He received his veterinary degree from the Western College of Veterinary Medicine and has worked both in private practice and in various other positions in the Manitoba government. Dr. Preston also operates a mixed grain and farm in Manitoba. Grain and cattle farm, sorry. So, Alan, I believe you are still muted, but whenever you're ready, you can turn on your webcam and turn off mute. There we go. Okay, just uh, hitting the webcam button. There we go. You can hear me now? We can. Okay, th thanks very again. much to. Oh, that'll come soon enough. <laughs> Okay. Uh, first of all, thanks Thanks very much to Alberta Beef Producers for the invitation to uh, take part tonight. I'm the old guy on this panel and I'm not very technologically savvy, so uh, Stacy will help you out by advancing the, uh, the slides as we move through them. Uh, I'm going to be a bit repetitious in some of the things that Karen talks about, but repetition is good for hammering home some points. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the history and background and the worldwide situation with regards to TB. Uh, give you some information on the Riding Mountain situation here in Manitoba, talk about surveillance programs, and also talk about biosecurity. So those are the things that I'm going to walk through over the next uh, 15 or 20 minutes. So we can move to the next slide. I guess, uh, again, we need to really understand why we even worry about this disease called bovine tuberculosis. And most of our focus is on the fact that it's a reportable disease and the TB free status that uh, Karen talked about is jealously guarded in terms of a trade uh, uh, advantage to Canada. But it's also important to understand that in other parts of the world this is indeed a production limiting disease. Uh, cattle do uh, suffer from the disease and die. Milk production in dairy cows goes down quite dramatically and it can have significant economic impacts on producers. The other aspect of the disease that we often forget to talk about is that it is a zoonotic disease. There are public health concerns with this disease and uh, as recently as a couple of years ago a slaughterhouse worker in the UK died uh, from contracting bovine TB on the kill floor. So we never want to forget that this uh, disease uh, does have those uh, public health implications. The other thing to remember too, and again Karen talked about the various uh, types of, of TB, um, worldwide one and a half to two million people die every year from TB, not from bovine TB but from the human form of disease. Uh, and we, we tend to forget sometimes that this ancient disease is, is with us uh, all the time and creating some problems. Next slide please. I'm a bit of a historian and I like to look back and, and see where some of the information came from that got us to where we are today. Uh, for those, uh, there may be a few people in the crowd that, that uh, are veterinarians and have gone through the Western College of Veterinary Medicine and you might recognize the name of Dr. John Gunyan Rutherford. Uh, there's, a, there's an annual uh, uh, guest lecture at the college in Saskatoon and his name has gone on for as long as the college has been in existence. This gentleman immigrated to Canada way back in the mid-1800s, uh, took his ed education at the Ontario Veterinary College <coughs> in Guelph and uh, uh, embarked on a pretty storied career and I could spend the rest of the night talking about this but I won't, I'll just touch on a couple of things of, of key interest. He was really the architect of the TB eradication programs that uh, brought us to where we are today and he had a keen interest in bovine TB for a very, very personal reason. Um, the un untimely death of his infant son from the disease contracted by drinking milk from an infected cow. Dr. Rutherford lived in Portage La Prairie at that point in time here in Manitoba 
and uh, the death of his son shaped uh, the rest of his career. He took on ever increasing roles, into, including being the veterinary director general and the livestock inspector, and along the way, quietly moved forward the municipal standards for the sale of milk, moving us towards a situation where all, all milk being sold is, uh, is pasteurized. And a quote from him, and this is a bit off course from the TB discussion, but it's a useful one uh, to, to put forward. The quote from Dr. Rutherford was, the sale of milk from cows not known to be free from tuberculosis is a crime against society, and any community permits the sale of such milk as an accessory to crime. So he was very passionate about this disease that uh, took, took the life of his child. Next slide, please. Karen's already talked about some of these uh, timelines, and I won't spend a lot of time going through them and repeating them, but I do want to just reinforce <clears throat> that in 1961, we did achieve uh, the uh, statistical freedom from the disease. In order to make progress from that, the decision was made uh, in 1978 to move towards depopulation of uh, complete herds when a positive animal was found. And using that approach, we did get that official TB-free status in uh, 1985, and we've been able to hold on to it ever since that time, except for a couple of little blips with, uh, with uh, regional outbreaks of the disease. The next slide, please. So what's happened in that, uh, in that century? Uh, uh, the prevalence of TB in, in Canada's uh, domestic cattle herd back at the turn of the, of the uh, 20th century was 25 percent. One in every three animals, uh, one in, pardon me, one in every 33 animals tested turned out to be a reactor. Uh, one in every 125 head of cattle that were slaughtered uh, which was a positive for TB. Over that uh, century we've tested 50 million head of cattle, found 400,000 reactors, paid out $15 million in compensation, and here we are in 2017 with a, with a prevalence so low that we can hardly uh, uh, register it. So we've come a, a tremendously long way, but uh, it's been a, a bit of a painful journey for sure. Next slide, please. Again, I want to just plant in people's mind that what we have in Manitoba and in Canada for a tuberculosis situation differs very dramatically from what happens worldwide. Uh, you'll see on the slide there were 50 million cattle are infected worldwide with this disease. These, the economic losses are staggering in terms of the number of dollars this costs the cattle industry worldwide. In turn, the economic benefits of the control programs that we enjoy here in, in the U.S. and Canada uh, are equally staggering. Uh, some estimates put it at roughly $10 million saving annually to the Canadian industry. So that's uh, pretty important. But it's also important to recognize uh, uh, that we have still have issues in Canada and we have issues uh, in North America, we have issues worldwide, and the issues are complicated in the areas where there's a wildlife reservoir for the disease. Uh, we have two of those situations here in Canada, the Riding Mountain uh, uh, National Park situation in Manitoba and the Wood Buffalo National Park situation in Alberta. So we're, we're looking at a situation where uh, what we see in, in, in Canada is not terribly different from what was happening in the rest of the world, but we, we need, do need to keep a, a finger on the pulse to get these things resolved. Next slide, please. I just want to touch briefly on this issue of wildlife, wildlife reservoirs, and this slide shows you the various critters out there that uh, harbor bovine tuberculosis and indeed uh, spread it back into the bovine population. Um, the, the UK with the situation with badgers is well known and their attempts to try to eradicate the badgers in, in terms of then dealing with the TB situation have created all sorts of uh, public relations issues for them that uh, they wish would, would go away. Much the same in, in New Zealand, the opossum is the critter there that seems to get the problem, uh, uh, the, the legs to keep going. Here in North America, we deal with uh, white-tailed deer in Michigan and Minnesota. We deal with elk and white-tailed deer in, in the Riding Mountain area. We deal with uh, bison in particular in Wood Buffalo in the National Park. Again, it's important to recognize that uh, these situations uh, are unique and they're challenging, but I will indicate to you that based on the work we've done in Manitoba, we really sincerely think that over the next uh, four or five years, we can get to a point where we actually eradicate uh, tuberculosis from that uh, uh, wild population. And if we do that, that'll be one of the first times that's happened in, in uh, all over the world. Next slide, please. 
just a few brief comments on the Rocky Mountain eradication uh, area and the experiences there. And just by way of reference, the practice that I was involved in for the first 21 years of my career and the location of my farm is uh, uh, all of about 35 to 40 miles uh, south from that uh, uh, Rocky Mountain area. So I'm very, very familiar with it from a number of different perspectives. We've been wrestling with this disease in Manitoba for the better part of 30 years now. Uh, over that time frame, there's been 235,000 head of cattle tested in some 2,700 herds. 14 of those herds uh, had one or more positive animals and were depopulated. The last positive cattle case we had in the province was in April of 2008, so we're well beyond that date in terms of, of uh, seeing any indication of a problem in, in the domestic uh, livestock population. Over that same time period, we've tested um, almost 10,000 head of white-tailed deer. We've seen 11 positives in that group, the last one in 2009. We've tested about 5,500 elk over that time frame with 47 animals testing positives, and the last one there was in May of 2014. We've expended uh, something in the range of 30 to $50 million over that 30-year period, and we really think that the end point is in sight uh, perhaps in 2021-22. Uh, one of the problems we're facing as we move towards the uh, the, the finalization of the, the, the uh, experience we've undergone in, in Riding Mountain is that there's a degree of complacency settling in and we really have to uh, guard against that complacency and keep the pedal to the metal until we, until we have this thing fi finally resolved. I'm going to move on now for the next slide to uh, touch on the topic of, of surveillance and again I think uh, Karen mentioned this briefly, but slaughter surveillance uh, in provincial and federal laboratories is indeed the primary screening test for bovine tuberculosis. Uh, it's the program that, that identified the Alberta Index case back uh, last September. It's the uh, program that, that identified the positive cases in BC and in Ontario, and indeed in the first case in the Rocky Mountain eradication area way back 30 years ago. Again, it was slaughter surveillance that, that picked that up. All carcasses uh, in the, the cow and bull end of things, at least not so much on fed cattle, but all, all carcasses are inspected and on the kill for. Suspicious gross lesions, these granulomatous lesions that Karen talked about are identified and uh, when required are sent for further testing, the acid fast staining, the PCR testing and the eventual culture. And using our CCIA tags and our traceback system, we can then follow any animals that uh, react to uh, these tests back to their herd of origin. Accessing the slaughter data is very, very critical for the scenario tree model for uh, diseases, uh, disease, disease uh, in cattle. And uh, without access to all of that slaughter data, our ability to predict what we need in terms of surveillance uh, tends to decline quite a little bit. We've been able to access the, the TNEP database uh, with regards to CCIA tags issued to producers within the RMEA and follow those cattle through to slaughter. And approximately 70% of the cattle who were issued tags were able to get slaughter data, slaughter data back on. And uh, indeed, uh, that slaughter data is, is very, very critical to our ongoing work around the park. The next slide uh, will be one that uh, we're, I'm going to be just a wee bit critical of the cattle sector and uh, its uptake on the whole issue of, of traceability. Um, in the RMEA in particular, we've got a low uptake in terms of producers getting their premises ID numbers. <clears throat> Even across the province, our numbers are in the 50 to 60 percent range. I talked to Karen just before the meeting. I think Alberta is crowding up towards the 75 to 80 percent level. Uh, I applaud them for that. We've got some work to do, but uh, it just indicates that that the uh, premise ID, the uh, animal identification, and the movement uh, information is is not as as robust as it could be at the present time, and we need to continue to work towards that. Certainly, any investigation, whether it be the TB situation in Alberta at the moment or the BSE uh, tracebacks we've had in recent time would certainly be far more uh, efficient and simpler if our traceability system was uh, a little more robust and a little closer to, to, to being complete. So that's my soapbox on that one. I'll just leave that alone and we'll move on to the next slide. So one more actually, picture for you. So, Sorry. Alan, did we want to do the oh, poll question here? Yes, by all means. Sorry, so, go ahead. No, no problem. So our next poll question um, is about the premise ID number. So do you have a premise ID number? Um, 
once again, your answers to these are anonymous to everybody else who is on the webinar. So first answer, yes, and it is linked to my CCIA account. Yes, and it is not linked to my CCIA account. Yes, and I'm not sure if it's linked to my CCIA account. And the bottom one, no. It looks like about everybody's getting their answers in here. Share, it looks like about 61% say that they do have a premise ID and it is linked to their CCA account number. Um, none are saying yes, that, but it's not linked. And about 13% aren't sure. 26% say no, they don't have one. All right, so back to you, Alan. But that's an interesting result. That sixty-one percent would tie in quite uh, nicely with this, the statistics we quoted. So, onward to uh, to, to lesions. Just to reinforce, this one isn't quite as dramatic as the picture Karen uh, pointed out to you. But this is a, a lung and trachea from a from an elk, and you can see those uh, uh, grayish white uh, uh, lesions within the lung tissue that are granulomas that uh, are quite indicative of tuberculosis. Uh, the next uh, slide, please. Just to uh, further further information on domestic livestock surveillance, as I said, we rely very heavily on that uh, slaughter surveillance, but there are other means of gathering data that uh, are in play all the time. Some targeted hurt, uh, testing takes place from time to time. There's a large amount of export testing done. Again, most of you will be aware that uh, with the exception of breeding stock from Manitoba going into the U.S., every other jurisdiction in Canada can move cattle into the U.S. theoretically without testing uh, because of, of USDA standards. Uh, unfortunately, we have a, a host of American states who impose their own TB testing uh, regimes. So again, there's a lot of cattle get tested every year to move into the U.S. Um, because of, of U.S. state regulations. The other aspect where we do a fair bit of, of testing is in semen and embryo uh, uh, collection programs. Animals that go into these programs have to undergo a battery of tests, including tuberculosis prior to admission. And again, this helps to qualify both the semen and embryos for export. And occasionally we may have producers initiate testing of their own volition. So there are these other avenues for, for testing that uh, provide even more surveillance data back into the data bank. What about on the wildlife side? And again, I, I realize this is something a little bit different uh, than the Alberta situation. Uh, but here in, in Manitoba, because we uh, do have the wildlife uh, reservoir for the disease, we've conducted uh, a lot of surveillance over the years on both elk and white-tailed deer and a number of other species. It would be important to note that our information with regards to the 30 years of experience here tell us that elk are indeed a true reservoir, reservoir for the disease that can uh, spread within the, the elk herd and can spread from elk to, uh, to cattle. By contrast, white-tailed deer are viewed as a spillover host. We don't think there's any transmission occurring between deer within, the, within that wild herd and the likelihood of deer actually spreading it to cattle are, are somewhat reduced. So what have we done? Uh, we put a regulatory, regulatory process in place for the game hunting areas around the park where it's mandatory to submit all 100 killed elk and deer. And you can see on the slide the numbers there. We received 119 white-tailed deer samples this past year and 55 elk in the past hunting season. I indicated earlier the, the uh, conglomerate statistics for how many we've seen over the years. In addition to that uh, hunter kill surveillance, uh, we occasionally, uh, or more than occasionally, go back into the park and do a live animal capture and testing program. In 2016, we captured uh, 73 mature cow elk, tested them, and uh, uh, this year in 2017, we haven't uh, seen the need or requirement to go back in and repeat that program. At this point in time, close to 100% of that core area mature cow elk herd has been tested. And again, to put it into perspective, uh, we've gone away from testing bulls because the risk factor with them is considerably less. And we've gone away from testing younger animals. So we're looking for uh, the mature cows, especially those ones that are now getting up into their 10 years of age and beyond as the most likely candidates to be positive for TB. So that's the group we, we tend to test. And uh, I'll know, I know it's not the point of this, uh, 
webinar, but I'll just briefly explain. The process is we net gun from a helicopter the animal uh, when they're when they're down on the ground. We tag them, put on a radio collar, draw a blood sample, and then release them. When the blood sample results come back, if there's any indication of a problem, we'll go back in a second time, recapture, and uh, uh, slaughter the animals and do the ongoing testing for TB. So that's kind of where we're at with the wildlife surveillance. I will mention that we've taken uh, uh, sort of random shots at a, at a range of different species, timber wolves, uh, foxes, coyotes, moose, gopher, badger, beaver, uh, even, even ground squirrels, looking to see if there are any other reservoir hosts similar to what we see in other areas of the world. And I'm pleased to report that we've yet to find any source of TB in anything other than elk and white-tailed deer. Next slide, please. This next picture, and it's a little hard to see, but this is a, the rib cage of a, a mature cow elk split open, and along the ribs you can see those little white dots. So we've referred to those as as pearls. Uh, certainly, in in terms of, of what's pathognomonic for bovine TB, this Im image is what is is what we see, and there's really no doubt when you see that that you're going to get a positive result back on culture. Uh, we uh, had a, several of these animals at, at the same time on the north side of the park, and it was when we started seeing these gross lesions in elk that people really came to the realization that the problem was significant, that the elk were a factor in, in, in the disease uh, transmission. I'm going to leave that topic of surveillance now and move into a few comments on, on biosecurity. Biosecurity uh, would be a, a webinar topic onto itself, so I'm just going to hit a few uh, highlights uh, from, from today's perspective. I think uh, we all agree that uh, the beef cattle biosecurity is, is uh, an important issue. There's a standard in place uh, that the Canadian Cattle Association has worked on over a, a number of years. <clears throat> and I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through these individual points other than to point out that really there are common sense uh, management protocols and there, there are aspects of herd health management that many producers are putting into place uh, already. I think uh, the, you know, the closed herd is is a is a easy concept to to work with, and the import uh, of animals to your herd from other herds of equal equivalent status is also a pretty simple uh, process. Uh, it's wise to have an incoming isolation and quarantine process in place. There's word mentioned about uh, avoiding commingling on pasture, and I will just comment from a tuberculosis perspective that co-mingling on pasture uh, is not a huge issue or a huge risk for us. Most of our, all of our information would tell us that transmission is more likely to occur in the winter months when animals are confined and when they're feeding off the same feed supplies. So the co-mingling on pasture is, is not a huge issue for tuberculosis. Certainly separation from wildlife is a key component. Having that good old veterinary client-patient relationship in place is, is key. And the last couple there are, are ones that we tend to gloss over from time to time, but having signage and a visitor log on your premise so you know who's coming and who's going is, is incredibly important. And people sometimes laugh at the inclusion of the, of the foot bath as an as a aspect of biosecurity. We lived through the, the situation with foot and mouth disease back in 2001 when there was a lot of concern about people and, and, and traffic coming from the United Kingdom into Canada and perhaps bringing the disease with them. The foot baths at airports were, uh, were very, very visible, probably had very little to uh, perhaps no effect on the risk of disease transmission, but they did provide the awareness that made people stop and think about where they've been, where they were going, whether they might have visited a farm and needed to declare it, those sorts of things. So those, those elements of biosecurity, although we sometimes tend to trivialize them, are extremely important and we need to uh, continue to, to move those elements forward. As I say, biosecurity is a topic onto itself. Uh, this is a very quick review of some of the, of the highlights and uh, I think in, in the future we may have more opportunity to, to discuss this in more detail. I want to just move on to a, to a picture just for a second that, uh, that kind of describes the dilemma we have here in, in Manitoba. Uh, it's not terribly clear, but uh, if you look in there very closely, you'll see that the white-tailed deer are commingled with the, the cattle, grazing on the same bales, uh, drinking out of the same uh, water bowls, and, and uh, really, in, in hindsight, it's, it's no real wonder that we ran into some of the difficulties we did in, in, in our backyard here. This common feed sources and intermingling at those feed sources, uh, feed contamination, all made uh, for relatively easy spread of, of the disease. 
So the goal for us has been to not only maintain our TB free status in the domestic herd, but as to lower the disease prevalence to undetectable levels in the wild herd. So speaking about biosecurity then from the perspective of uh, the Riding Mountain eradication area and indeed other areas that would have a situation with a, a wildlife reservoir. There's a number of factors here. I'll just kind of walk through them fairly, uh, fairly quickly. The first uh, component that has been very useful is to conduct an arm farm risk assessment on herds within the area and identify the risk factors for that particular farm and then, then develop a program that helps to address those, uh, those risks. Uh, the goal is to primarily to avoid uh, or eliminate where possible any direct or indirect contact between domestic cattle and the, the wild servant population. Protecting the feed supply is a must and that's why we have moved to uh, using hay barrier fencing in a lot of areas around the park, uh, getting the, the hay moved in off the, the, for, the fields in, in, in quick order in the fall, getting it in behind fences and keeping the wildlife out has been critical to our ability to stop the spread of the disease. We've done a little bit of uh, feed yard fencing. Uh, it's a real challenge with large feed yards uh, from the perspective that it's very, very expensive to do that. So we've moved to a slightly different alternative now. We're doing some research, research on three-dimensional 3D fences, uh, very, very much more economical to, to assemble. Uh, the work we've done over the, over the last three or four years have been uh, quite uh, beneficial in terms of uh, the, the ability of these fences to keep elk and deer away from cattle. And I think as time goes on, we will see more and more uptake and use of those types of fences as opposed to the standard barrier fences. Another element of the biosecurity that uh, has come into play and is, is turning out to be very, very useful is the use of guardian dogs in, in, in these herds. Uh, I don't pretend to be an expert on, on guardian dogs, but there are breeds that are very, very uh, proficient at protecting the, uh, uh, the, the, the herd that they grow up in. And boy, these critters are, are very, very adept at keeping both deer, elk, wolves, and coyotes away from, the, from their cows. So it's a, an aspect we need to continue to explore. The last three, the last two uh, bullets on there talk about habitat enrichment and population control in the, in the elk population. Uh, certainly by improving the habitat within the park, we've been able to encourage elk to stay there and not meander out quite so much. And certainly keeping the, the number of elk down to a, a more manageable number has been critical to uh, reducing the, the spread of disease as well. The last bullet mentions buffer zones, and I envy the situation that, that Wood, Wood Buffalo National Park has. Uh, someday that situation may erupt and cause us some grief, but one of the saving graces is there's a large expanse of land, as I understand it, between where the buffalo are and where the domestic livestock populations exist. We don't have the luxury of that uh, separation here in Manitoba, and it has complicated our ability to uh, deal with this disease. Just a couple of quick pictures. First is, uh, is is just a gate uh, in one of these structures. We have to make sure the gates are are such that animals can't go either underneath or over top. And the other picture is is just another sidebar view of the of a facility. If you can advance the slide, there, Stacy, just indicates the, the forages that are um, in under cover, and uh, the, these barrier fences have worked well. Were we going to do another poll question that I that I breezed by, Stacy? We can do another one here. So our next and then I'll finish question up. is, for sure. So for this one, you can click all the apply for your all that apply on your operation. Once again, your answers here are anonymous to everybody else on the webinar tonight. So which of the following biosecurity practices do we use? Um, visitor logbooks, closed herds, isolation facilities and protocols, signage or protective buildings? Some time to get in your answers. Oh, it looks like my answers have stopped coming in here. So it looks like about 30% say they use a visitor log book. About 40% have a closed herd, 50% have isolation facilities and protocol, 25% have signage, and about 20 use protective clothing. 
Mm-hmm. Interesting. Okay, just one one last slide, and then I'll pass the baton back to to Karen. Just wanted to give you a heads up that the USDA has had on the books for several years now a proposed rule on bovine brucellosis and tuberculosis. And in essence, what this rule would would move to is a reduced emphasis on the test and slaughter program, and more of an approach of looking at standards for disease surveillance, epidemiological investigations, and animal health plan, uh, that sort of thing. Part of the driver for this uh, is simply that uh, with today's uh, very very large cattle herds in both Canada and the U.S., when we move to total herd uh, uh, removal, the the cost of the public purse is is huge. So. Uh, stay tuned. This one's been on the books, as I say, for several years, and we'll see what happens when it moves forward. But as is always the case, whatever happens in the U.S. Uh, certainly has implications for us here in Canada. So uh, we'll drop a stop at that point and turn the uh, table back to Karen. Thank you very much, Alan. And as we said, well, next we'll hear from Karen again. She will give us another update here. All right, just let me pull this up here. All right, so Alan, Alan talked a lot about, you know, what we do in peacetime um, and, and the surveillance processes and, and general biosecurity that we, sh- we should be using during the, those, the, the regular day-to-day activities. But when we have a positive case, we move into eradication mode. And it's important to remember that eradication is different than surveillance. And what we really are trying to do in an eradication program is ensure that we get all the little last vestiges of the disease and make sure we stamp it out. Because the worst thing in the world would be to be back in the same area a year later doing the exact same process. So when we do have a positive case, a disease investigation is instigated and it really contains three main components. It contains quarantines, an epidemiological investigation, and then screening and confirmatory tests. And the disease investigation starts off with animal tracing and we trace animal movements for five years and this is pretty much an international standard at this point to do that five-year tracing. So we look at animals that have had direct or fence line contact, herds with purchased animals from an infected herd, we call those trace outs, so those are animals that moved out of the infected herd into other herds and then animals that have been purchased from other herds. So we call those trace-ins. So those are animals that have come in to that infected herd from another source herd. And it's important to note that even though we find a case somewhere, that original case may not be the source. And so we tend to start to think of of those index cases as, as the original part of the disease and and that may not be the case. So those tracing efforts are really important. So when we talk about quarantines, we look at, say here's our infected cow with the little red X. She lives with some red cows and some other black cows, so all of those cows would obviously be under quarantine. These orange cows and the blue cows share fence line with the infected animal. But the green ones don't, they don't share a fence. So you'd think that they'd be safe from a quarantine, except they'd bought some animals out of the black herd. So that makes them a trace out herd. So they would indeed uh, have to undergo a quarantine. And that leads us to epidemiology. And if you've been following the investigation at all in Alberta, you, you hear a lot about the the results of our epidemiological investigation or our epidemiological investigation led us to do this. So but no one really knows what epidemiology means. So really it's the study and analysis of patterns, causes and effects of disease conditions in a population. And what they're really looking for here is the risk of disease transmission. So they're looking at who the animals are, when they were together, how long they were together, what type of contact they had. And that allows them to basically design a risk profile for disease transmission. So here we have another example. Here we have an infected cow. There's some other infected cows in this particular herd. They spend some time with some green cows and some blue cows. Sometimes the blue cows go back home. 
they have the opportunity to carry that disease back to other blue cows in the blue herd. Same with the green cows, so they can carry that back home to the green cows as well. This is a separate black herd, but it also has a positive. So we have to trace where all those black cows may have gone. It turns out that this other black cow who happened to be from this black herd was also positive. Sometimes they live with these red cows. There's another positive black cow who actually came from this herd. Sometimes she lives with some orange cows. But sometimes the orange cows and the red cows spend time together. So it can get very complicated very, very quickly, especially when we deal with situations such as community pastures where there's extensive animal commingling or there's movement from pasture to pasture and we don't have records of where each animal was at any given time. So really animal records and, and knowing where your cows are at any given time and which cows went where, it becomes really, really important in a disease investigation because if you can prove actually that this, these orange cows and these red cows are different from these orange cows and these red cows that never spent time, these ones never spent time with these ones, they could possibly be excluded from the investigation and testing and any depopulations that might have to occur. So record keeping is extremely important. The epidemiology also helps us determine risk levels. And, and we really want to look at, at animals with the most risk and move downwards towards animals with the least risk. So the ones that we have the most risk, we deal with first and we move down the chain to the least risk. So obviously our, our most risky group are infected herds where we have confirmed positives. Then any animals that they had direct contact with, they're the next level of risk trace outs, animals that left that infected herd um, are the next level of risk. Fence line contacts are below that, so they may have had the opportunity to come into contact with an infected herd, but we don't really know if they did or not. And then trace-ins are our lowest risk of cattle. Um, and this is a little counterintuitive because your, your trace-ins are, are potentially a source of the disease, but they're also have undergone you know, the regular slaughter surveillance and they're basically the same risk as any other cattle in Canada because they've been going through that same surveillance. When we talk about testing, there's a couple of important concepts and those are specificity and sensitivity. And this is gonna get a little technical and I apologize, but it, it explains why we do the types of tests we do and really no lab tests are perfect and, and unfortunately our tests for TB are probably not as good as we would like them to be. So when we talk about specificity, what we're talking about is that the positives are correctly identified. So as your specificity goes up, your rate of false positives go down. So it's correctly identifying the animals that are truly infected. With sensitivity, you're correctly identifying your negative animals. So as sensitivity goes up, your rate of false negatives go down. So you're not um, missing an animal that's actually positive. And then we get into the concept of serial testing versus parallel testing. And, and this is where you use a combination of tests one on top of the other or at the same time. So serial is one on top of the other and it will weed out extra false positives. So you're not um, dealing with animals that don't have the disease as positive. Um, so that you'd use one test and then another test in, in series to, to weed out those false positives. Whereas parallel testing, you're doing two tests at once and it's basically, it's casting a wider net. So you weed out the false negatives. So you're missing, you're, you're reducing the chance that any animal you may find um, that you don't miss one that's actually positive and it comes back as, as negative. And, and in eradication scenarios, we tend to use more of the parallel testing and in surveillance, we tend to use more serial testing because in surveillance, we don't want to be uh, killing animals we don't have to be. In eradication, we don't want to miss anything. 
So what kind of tests do we actually use when we're, when we're dealing with tuberculosis? And, and the main live animal test that we use, this is the initial test, it's used everywhere around the world, it's the caudal fold or the skin test. So that's basically when you inject uh, some tuberculin into the fold by the tail head and you come back three days later and, and you read that and I'll get into a little bit more of that later. There's also some supplemental live animal tests that we use, one called comparative cervical test or CCT. So after the caudal fold test what will be done is they'll shave an area in the neck, they'll inject bovine tuberculin as well as avian tuberculin and they'll look at the difference in inflammation. We also have a Bovigam test, this is a blood test, and an ELISA, which is another type of blood test, and I'll, I'll go into a little bit more detail on those. So the caudal fold, like I said, is the tuberculin injection, and what we're looking for is the delayed hypersensitivity reaction read three days later. So if you can see, and I know the picture is a little blurry, but right here, that's a reaction to the tuberculin injection. So that's what we would call a reactor. The caudal fold test relies on cell-mediated immunity, and there's different types of the immune system that these, these tests target, and, th and that's important. Um, so basically, white blood cells are going to the injection site to cause that little lump. So that's white blood cells going to the injection site to fight off infection and causing that inflammation. So even in herds that haven't been exposed to any sort of bovine tuberculosis, you'll expect to get about a 2 to 4% reactor rate. And that's because the, the reaction will occur to all sorts of different types of mycobacteria, primarily avian, but also other types of mycobacteria can cause that same lump. So the comparative cervical test it will screen out the avium cross reactions because they're injecting avian into the neck as well and they measure the difference in inflammation between the two to determine if they're a reactor. This is also cell mediated immunity, so those white blood cells going to the site of the injections. The Bovagam test is a blood test that me measures something uh, called gamma interferon and it will screen out both avium and yoni's cross reactions, but uh, not other mycobacteria in the tuberculosis complex. And it's also dealing with that cell mediated immunity, that cell type of, that white blood cell part of the immune system. So the ELISA test is an enzyme linked immunosorbent assay, and you don't have to remember that, that that's not part of the test later. It's a, it's a blood test that looks for specific antigens or antibodies. So this is a different part of the immune system that we call humoral immunity. And it doesn't have any cross-reactivity with avium or yonis either. And some rare documented instances where it will cross-react with a type of mycobacterium found in the environment called Kansasai. So I'm not aware of any uh, documented cases in Canada of cross-reaction, um, but there have been some elsewhere in the world where it has, uh, has cross-reacted. So basically what we're doing, we take those reactors from those live animal tests and we take them to an enhanced post-mortem. We take samples from various lymph nodes and we put them under a microscope and that's called histopathology. And what we'll see is something like this. So this is actually a, a slice of a lymph node with tuberculosis in it. And the, these darker, darker symptoms and these lighter, these big light pieces, they stain it so that the tuberculosis shows up. The, they can then do a DNA PCR which can confirm whether it's actually Mycobacterium bovis or if it's some other type of Mycobacterium. If they find bovis, they can declare a positive. It meets the case definition of a positive after the histo and PCR. But the gold standard is always culture. So sometimes you can get a negative histo, you can get a negative PCR, and you can still grow Mycobacterium bovis. And that's because it's a very, very sneaky bacteria. So the gold standard is always culture. So after they culture, they'll do another DNA PCR, and then they can confirm that as a negative animal if nothing grows. Um, if something does grow, they use that 
that PCR to do strain differentiation because like I said before there's lots of different types of, of Mycobacterium bovis and it grows very very slowly so this whole testing time basically from the time that the enhanced postmortem is done to the time that the culture is finished cooking is about 14 weeks. Time for pop quiz Stacy. All right. So our last poll question of the night, as Karen mentioned, is another pop quiz question. So, um, in any disease eradication situation, an ideal test would be highly specific, highly sensitive, sorry, is the first one highly specific, be able to be performed on easily collected samples, have a fast turnaround time, or all of the above. So select the one that most, or that you think fits, All right, so it looks like everybody's just getting their answers in here. So, all right, so about 7% say highly sensitive, 4% say highly specific, and the rest say all of the above. And the, the all of the above is correct. Maybe I should have made my questions harder. <laughs> they were doing really well. I really like yeah, people are paying attention. That's nice. Okay, I think I have one more slide here. So, cleaning and disinfection. It applies to infected and presumed infected premises only. So, if you're just under quarantine as a as a trace out or a trace in, you don't have to worry about cleaning and disinfection. Oops, I don't know what I did there. Sorry. Um, it's a specific protocol and it's site specific and you develop that in conjunction with CFIA. So if the if you carry out your, your cleaning and disinfection protocol, your restocking can occur about 45 days later, but we need those 45 days to be at an average of about 12 degrees because as we said, it's, it's sensitive to sunlight and heat. Um, Restocked animals are generally subject to two annual herd tests at about six months and 18 months. That first annual herd test is really to make sure that the person wasn't so extremely unlucky as to buy some cattle that happened to have TB when he restocked. That would, that would just be the worst run of bad luck. But the 18th month test is to, to try and make sure that the cleaning and disinfection was effective, that there's not an environmental or a wildlife reservoir somewhere that we should look at as well. If the owner chooses to do no C&D whatsoever, they can wait two years before restocking and then they have no testing that would be required. So that's it for me, Stacy. I'll turn it back over to you for question period. All right, thank you very much, Karen. So with that, if I can get all of our presenters to turn their microphones off of the mute and to turn on their webcams, and we will get sharing my screen. Right and Alan, I believe you're with us as well. I'm still here. Yep. Perfect. All right. So, um, as I mentioned, type your questions into the chat box on the side of your screen. If your control panel is closed, you should see an orange arrow near the top. Um, click on that arrow and it'll expand and you'll be able to use that chat box to type your questions. And then I'll read them aloud and we'll hear from our presenters today. We did have a couple questions actually emailed in ahead of time. So our first one was asking about alternative vaccines for TB. Is there anything available? I'll kick that off if, if that's all right, Alan. Um, so there's been a lot of efforts go into creating a vaccine for TB. One of the largest issues is actually the ability to tell a vaccinated animal from an animal that's actually infected. So in a lot of cases, the tests that we have available wouldn't be able to distinguish between a vaccinated animal and an animal that was infected, and that would jeopardize our current free status. So that's one problem with vaccines. 
There is some research currently going on at the University of Saskatchewan with the Vaccine and Infectious Disease Organization there, uh, VITO, who are trying to develop a, a vaccine for TB that would be able to be differentiated between vaccinated animals and animals that were infected. So you could tell if the animal had a vaccine or if it actually had the disease. Um, I think that that vaccine is probably a ways off. And I do know that multiple efforts um, to try and create a vaccine for humans have not been overly effective either. So, Alan, I don't know if you have some more to add there. I just to reinforce that aspect that we uh, uh, we are TB free. We jealously guard that status, and any use of of vaccines that would mask uh, infections or confuse infections with uh, vaccine reactions would actually be a step backwards. And this is a very nice parallel to bovine brucellosis. Uh, a number of years ago we used to vaccinate cattle for brucellosis on a regular basis. Found out as we tried to eradicate the disease that the confusion between the vaccine reactors and actual diseased animals was difficult to to distinguish. So from, from my perspective and I think from the perspective of the countries view of our of our status, we're far better off to avoid any vaccinations. All right, so the next question was also emailed in ahead of time, so I think you both might have touched on this a little bit, but can you comment a little bit more on the relationship between um, bovine TB and paratuberculosis? So they're, they're both caused by mycobacterium, but they're, they're different species of mycobacterium. Um, Yonis is caused by mycobacterium avian paratuberculosis and, and obviously bovine TB is caused by mycobacterium bovis. Um, they, they share some similarities but in terms of the, the slow moving nature of the disease, uh, the progressive nature of the disease, but they, they are different. Um, I'm going to turn the more technical aspects over to the veterinarian in the room. <laughs> Thanks for that. <laughs> uh, no, I think you summarized it quite well. They're, they're similar, but they're very, very different. And uh, uh, there really isn't much confusion between the two. Uh, we have made tremendous strides on tuberculosis eradication. If I live long enough, we might see, see similar strides made in terms of uh, Yoni's disease eradication. But the, at the present time, it's uh, it's much more of an issue, much more of a problem for us than, than bovine TB is. I think maybe one of the other things to mention is that the the tests for yonis, um, they really, they're probably worse than our TB tests and, and they work quite well in, in dairy when you can do repeated sampling of the same animals over and over again. Um, because they only really detect animals as they're shedding the bacteria. Um, in beef herds, it's a little bit trickier to try and try and nail down positive Yoni's animals. Maybe Reynolds right. wants to chime in. And just a plug for biosecurity. Biosecurity, sorry, biosecurity elements are very, very critical to uh, keeping para TB out of your herd in the first place. So uh, just reinforce the notion that that closed herds and where you source animals, uh, isolation and quarantine facilities are all vitally important in keeping that disease out. All right, thanks. So there are a couple questions here coming in that are specific to the current TB situation in Alberta. What we're going to do with those is I'll actually um, pass them on to Karen. And um, so first off, um, there is more information on the Alberta Beef Producers website if you are looking for updates on that situation. And if not, I'll pass on Karen's contact information so she can answer those directly. Does that work? Sure, I can do that. Perfect. So the next question coming in here, does human to cattle TB infection occur? I think yes, it is possible. Human to, human to cattle? I, theoretically it's possible. I think it would be quite rare. Agreed. On both categories, it's, it, it, it is indeed possible, to, but very, very rare. All right. So I have a couple more questions in, so we'll shut it down after they're done. So if nobody, um, so if you do have any questions, please type them into the chat box right away here or else you'll miss your opportunity. So my next question here, 
there is somebody who says that they're seeing more white-tailed deer in their area. Is this something that they should be concerned about? I missed part of that. Is someone seeing white-tailed deer in with their cattle? Yeah, and is it something they should be concerned about? I think there's always concerns. I think the concern for tuberculosis is, is minimal. As I indicated with, with uh, several years of, of data and information, we're relatively comfortable in, in indicating that white-tailed deer are a spillover host, not, a, not an animal that spreads it back to cattle. But there are, are other diseases that there might be a concern. So I think uh, uh, as part of general biosecurity, trying to keep a separation between wild animals and your domestic herd, uh, especially between wild uh, ruminants and your, and your domestic herd is a, is a good policy. Whether that be guardian dogs, uh, how you manage your, your uh, stored feed, whatever, but uh, trying to keep that separation is, is a good biosecurity principle. We have one more question to begin here. So what is involved when um, cleaning, uh, for the cleaning process, so I'm assuming after a uh, premise has been declared infected? So that it really depends on your operation and, and that's why each C&D plan is site specific but in, in general terms what they'll be looking at is you know areas like handling facilities where cattle have mingled quite a bit um, if they're made out of metal you can flame them if they're made out of wood you can steam them uh, in those types of areas where it's congregated um, they may ask to scrape uh, about an inch of dirt off and then spread that somewhere where cattle aren't grazing. Um, in areas where there might be some highly infective material around dugouts, they may ask to harrow it to break up those fecal patties and expose them to sunlight. Um, but it, it really depends on your operation and, and what your setup's like. It's very site specific. Our next question is for Reynolds. So is the BCRC considering funding any new research related to bovine TB, or are you aware of any new research on bovine TB that's underway? Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll start, and then I'm going to throw, throw it over to Karen, actually. Um, no, we're not. The uh, We did, when we got our letters of intent, there were a couple that were related to bovine TB, um, but they, they didn't make it past the first cut, and that wasn't because nobody on the council is concerned about TB. The, it was simply the, the practical consideration that that we're, the, 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 the planning process we're in now is for research that isn't going to be completed until 2023. And so, so that any results from that are going to come in far too late to be of any, any uh, relevance to the, to the current situation. Um, the other, the other consideration there is that, that you know I showed that map of Canada with all the other funders and, and one of the things that we've seen over the years is that, that when situations like this come up, whether it's you know BSE or, or things like you know the, the maple leaf um, listeria outbreak, um, it, it's it's a re there are a number of funders that are that are really inclined to snapping to attention with those with those issues and really pouring resources to them and those are typically funders that have a lot more resources than we do and so so we're not uh, we're not concerned that 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 uh, other funders won't won't be there to pick up the the slack on that and and also come up with results in a lot more a lot more timely fashion. Um, the other thing, and this is where I'll throw it over to Karen, is that that as if she hopefully she's willing to do this, but I think um, it, due to her involvement in this uh, ongoing TB thing, she's been researching all the various tests and vaccines and whatnots so that that have been coming up and it's remarkable actually the number of new tests and vaccines that that are that are available that are that are coming up now and uh, from you know both private and and academic groups throughout the world and and so they're they're uh, you know these things are coming up all the time and 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 there might might and that be the opportunity to test some of those things on some of the samples that are getting collected during the current outbreak 
Yeah, I, I think you're right there, Reynold. I mean, just recently there was an announcement out of the UK that they developed a new test. There's a new test out of New Zealand. CFIA is working on a new test. Um, I think, you know, at some point we have to stop trying to develop new tests and see if they work better than see if the new tests that have already been developed work better in our situation than the current tests we have. Um, so, so this may give us the opportunity to test some of those and validate some of those tests. Um, and as I said before, there's a lot of vaccine research going on around the world. Uh, whether or not those efforts are successful, it's always a long-term proposition when we're talking about vaccine development. We'll, we'll just have to wait and see. Um, Alan may be aware of some other things as well. No, nothing to add. Okay, so our next question here. It was talked about how wildlife surveillance is going on, but is there also any surveillance in other production animals like poultry or swine? In terms of TB, not so much. Um, in, they are susceptible um, to, to both of those things, but the, the nature of their, their production systems, because they're fairly self-contained in, in the barns, um, it, doesn't, there's, it doesn't really spread outside of that, that unit. So I don't know, maybe Alan knows, but I can't remember the last time we had a case in swine. Um, I don't recall any in, in my uh, my history on, with the yeah. disease, so I think uh, there, there really isn't any other surveillance going on in other species, and I guess at the present time there are no real indications that we should be pro providing surveillance on, on those other domestic species. All right, so it looks like we have one last question here. Are we increasing the risk of disease transmission through extensive winter feeding systems such as swamp and bale grazing? I'll take a quick uh, run at that one. I, I guess one of the things that has, is, is a bit of a sore point with a number of our producers in the Riding Mountain area is that uh, we, through the on-farm risk assessment, we actually discourage uh, some of the management techniques such as swath grazing and bale grazing because those two enterprises in, in an area where you have uh, elk and deer who could inter intermingle with, your, with your, your cattle do increase the risk. Um, that's a, a bit of a slap in the face to the producer who wants to take advantage of techniques that will probably be economically more viable for his farm than, than the, uh, the way he used to feed his cattle. But the reality is that there are risks involved in using those mechanisms in, uh, in an area where you may have uh, diseased wildlife. So um, again, the, the risk might be low, but it's real. And uh, the, the, the better better course of action is to avoid those procedures that could, could be risky behavior. I think, I think what we find a lot of times with, with extensive grazing, grazing oh, situations. Oh, oh, you're really crackly again. Oh dear, oh dear. Why don't, why we, don't try we try this? How's that? Perfect. Better? So I think what we see in in a lot of extensive situations where we're trying to swath graze or we're trying to bail graze is that oftentimes the, the feed loss is actually too great when they have a, a large wildlife population in the area that it, it doesn't pay anyways. Um, so even if they wanted to take advantage of some of those low-cost extended grazing techniques, they can't because the wildlife eat that feed. Um, so, so in some ways, it, it, it's almost self-defeating when there is a, a large wildlife population in the, in the area. All right. So that's it for our question and answer period. So I just have a couple more important things to let you know about before we go. So the first is how to get more information and science-based production advice through the BCRC. You can go to our website, beefresearch.ca, and click the subscribe button to sign up for our free email list. If you have Twitter, Facebook, or a YouTube account, you can connect with us there as well. Um, I also wanted to point out we do have two more webinars coming up this year. So the next one will be fairly soon here on managing internal parasites. And the next next one is managing native seeded forages. So please join us for that as well. So very shortly, as soon as this webinar ends, I'm going to ask you to complete a short survey that asks about tonight's session and what you're most interested in for future webinar topics.
We need your feedback to do the best job we can to deliver information that's both useful and meaningful to you and helps you make informed decisions on your operation. So please complete that survey and don't hesitate to contact me with any questions, comments, or suggestions at any time. Within the next couple of days, you'll also be receiving an email from me with a link to watch the recording, as well as some additional information on Bovine TV. So that's it. I want to thank all of you at home for joining us tonight. And on behalf of everybody, I'd like to thank Reynolds, Karen, and Alan for volunteering your time tonight. Good night. Thank Thanks, you. Everyone. Thank you.